Okay. Hi, everybody. It's 9.30, so we'll be starting promptly. Well, right now. Uh, as Rod said, hi, we're the Quantum Engineering Research Group. We're here until 11.30. And I'll first just quickly start with our the IRTF not well. Um, so please pay attention. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, and as a reminder, since we are the ARTF, our goals are quite broad, and so therefore, hence the kind of theme of today's session, which is quite, well, it's, it's very broad. Sure, so the uh, meeting tips, um, as I said, for, for those of you who were just uh, a couple minutes ago, please do make sure you use one of the QR codes that's posted here or elsewhere and scan in. That gets you recorded in the blue sheets. We do need your attendance because it helps with a lot of different things. Um, we do have some remote participants today. I'm not sure exactly how many at the moment, but this uh, one of the things this means is that we need um, to manage the Q&A queue as one thing. So if you have questions, um, don't just line up at the microphone. Please use the on-site Meet Echo tool to, uh, to, uh, raise, to virtually raise your hand and say you want to uh, um, uh, have a, a question. Remote participants, um, yes, same thing. Uh, if you raise your hand through, through the tool, we can, uh, we can recognize you in order there. All right, next slide. So um, for those of you who've been around for a while and also for the newcomers, um, the, the tools have been sort of shifting icons and shifting places and things like that a little bit over the course of the last couple of ITFs. So you'll see in the top there in the middle, from the IETF, IETF agenda, Tuesday morning, first session, you will, see a, uh, you will see the QIRG listed and that set of icons there on the right and the on-site tool looks like a telephone handset now. Um, it used to look like something else, but the, the telephone handset, is, at least on my browser, is the uh, is the telephone handset there, which will take you to the on-site tool, like the thing in the upper right on your laptop or in the lower right on your uh, on your cell phone. And the hand with a slash through it is how you raise your hand uh, if you have a question. And also note that one of the one of the uh, links, I think it's the chat bubble from the on-site thing, will take you to the uh, chat window like the one shown uh, in the middle at the bottom. So there, there's a set of tools. Please make use of them. Great. Thanks. Um, and with that, let's actually start uh, the session. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so today we've got a quite a packed agenda, so we will be quite strict with the time. Uh, the new Miteco tool has some fancy timer options, so I'll try to make use of those. Uh, this is an overview of the agenda. We'll start with some with our chairs, with our uh, with a bit of administrativia, followed by uh, basically five talks, and at the at the end, Rodney has a few announcements to make. Actually, I forgot to update this agenda, but I updated the online agenda. The last the last talk is not the speaker pulled out, and we'll be speaking at the next session instead. Uh, and the 6G session is 20 minutes. Sorry about that. Um, just a brief up, uh, update on the RG status. The, the current, there's a one draft in process right now and it's currently an ISG review. So we won't be hearing any update on that today. Uh, and before I hand over to the first speaker, I wanna make a single note um, about um, the relevance of QKD to the QIRG. So we often emphasize that the QRG is mostly looking at beyond QKD applications of quantum entanglement. 
I do, my personal view is that it uh, would be short-sighted to not also look at the current, today's QKD efforts. And the reason is as follows. Uh, Europe, since we're in the European session, Europe is building a quantum communications infrastructure today. Projects are underway and nodes are being deployed uh, for QKD networks. At the physical layer, the technology is very different. Well, very different. They're, they both use fiber. They both send photons over the fiber. So there is all, actually, there are some similarities and some shared concerns of the physical layer, but the protocols at the physical layer are different. However, there might be quite a lot of synergies in the higher layers, especially in the control and management layers, as well as many other layers that maybe I'm not really considering at the moment. But at least I, in my own work, I'm very often involved in some QKD projects specifically with a view of looking how they will upgrade to entanglement networks. Because the important thing to remember is we won't build separate entanglement networks. They will evolve from the QKD networks, the QCI networks we build today. And hence why, uh, at least my point of view is shared, it's good to also give a uh, forum to uh, the networks that are being built today. And with that, um, that's it for the chair slides. And I would like to invite the first speaker, Diego, up to stage. Two, two things while you're doing that. So so the first couple of talks, or first three, are QKD, and then and then the next two are more about entangled networks out of the set of things that we have today. And one more, um, another call for a uh, note taker. Martin has volunteered to, to take notes, but uh, it's a two hour session, so he could use some help. And he's probably not very good at taking notes while he's speaking. So I think Jigen volunteered to help, didn't he? OK, Jigen will help with the, with the note taking. All right. Diego, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Uh, the, the idea of all this, uh, the ideas of this draft and this presentation comes from a conversation I have with Wojtek. He was in Yokohama, right? On the, uh, on the idea that uh, some of the experiences that we have gained so far with the QKD networks um, could be somehow applied in the, uh, for planning the general uh, quantum internet and try to get some uh, lessons that we have learned on how to associate it in the uh, for the for, for further deployment of the uh, of development of the technologies as he uh, was mentioning before it's true that the technologies at the uh, at the physical level are quite different but the kind of uh, uh, of uh, architectural principles when, uh, when talking about control and management should be the same. And there are certain principles that should be applicable in, in, in both cases. And it's important that we gain some, uh, some uh, insight from what has happened so far. Can you move on, please? So the idea and the proposal is about, uh, is, a, is an architectural framework that can be used as a reference for further protocol and interface and, and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a further reference for analyzing how we can build a quantum internet that is fully operational and that is fully um, usable together with the uh, with other uh, networks among them, the classical networks because it's essential that we make something that is, uh, is not out of the, uh, it has to be developed totally in parallel and, and uh, without coordination with the, uh, with the current networks, is about uh, identifying, um, providing the framework to locate several proposals that are in the, in the draft are mentioned, et cetera, about different architecture, different possibilities for routing uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum interactions. And for example, one of the that is mentioned is about a packet-like approach to it. And the idea is to allocate this packet-like, circuit-like, or whatever, and, and try to identify how they are connected and how they can uh, inter interact, taking into account the previous experience. Let me insist on that. And try to apply the, uh, the uh, principles that already have been agreed or proposed in the in the community, uh, and something that is important is to support convergence. The, the idea that uh, as we have, the, uh, as, we, as, as we discuss here and in other fora about uh, the progress on the quantum internet, etc., we have a set of common understandings in what we are in what we are calling 
a particular a particular function, a particular goal of a of a of a particular set of protocols, etc. Well, when talking about use cases, applications, technologies, management, scaling, that is essential if we think about a real internet. And we're trying to more or less put uh, ways in which we can classify and identify how the research effort is uh, taking place. Can you move on? So uh, to this, uh, I, I took uh, um, some uh, in initial goals that I took from, uh, from one of the papers that I referenced there is about the, uh, the, the three main goals for a quantum internet regarding universality, so we can accommodate an application despite the difference in the technologies and the difference on the on the how things are achieved at the physical uh, level or at the uh, in terms of the uh, of the technologies that can be can be even proprietary transparency in the in the sense that we don't require a full deployment of an independent physical network for that because that would limit enormously the, uh, the availability of the quantum internet and for sure scalable we need something that probably would not reach the full scale of the current internet, but it's something that should not, the, the decisions we make or the proposals we make should not uh, impact the future, the future growth of the, uh, of, the rest, of, the, of the network. And for this, uh, for the framework architecture, we, we have built it with, uh, with three main uh, goals, or three main characteristics. It's about agility, so it's able to adapt to the technology as it uh, as it goes on, as an example from QKD is that the idea that uh, right now without feasible quantum repeaters that you can deploy on the field, you need to rely on, on trusted nodes. And the idea is that you can move from trusted nodes to, to repeaters in an agile way, or you can incorporate new mechanisms for for uh, um, sharing entanglement, sustainability in the sense that is able to be economically sustainable and support infrastructure real, reuse. Uh, let me say, I work for an operator and something that it would be for us a nightmare. It would be to commercially justify a full deployment of a totally parallel network. And then it's something that uh, originally I call it um, malleability. And then somebody told me that this in, in terms of uh, crypto is totally uh, incorrect. So we started to call pliability. The idea is that it can adapt to the uh, classical mechanisms for, for doing management and control, etc. So we can integrate it in the current best practices for network management. Can you move on? So for this, for the QKD case, as uh, Rod was mentioning before, there is a number of uh, running infrastructure not as a, at a huge scale, but I would say at, at a sufficient scale, specifically in, uh, with, with probably the most important thing, we have hit the, uh, uh, the, the real people, users and admins. We started having problems with people that are not so much aware of quantum and the relevance of quantum computing, etc. but they are, they are concerned about their application or they're concerned about the ease for management of this. And well, we, we have found that, uh, well, we have started working with uh, beyond achieving, uh, achieving pure quantum uh, uh, communication. And these are the that, uh, image that you have over there. These are three nodes of the ring we have in Madrid. And with all the, the, the gear and the different connections, et cetera, that are required to make the whole thing work in a way that satisfies users and admins. And well, if you are interested, we can go into more detail about the difficult, the different uh, WDM things, et cetera, that are over there. But this is to give you an idea that there is real, this real operational experience and the idea is to translate it from the QKD to QKD networks to the, to the future quantum internet. Can you move on? And for that, well, in the, in the draft, there is a mention to a general QKD framework Basically, and, and this is one of the problems, now we are talking about different things or different naming in different things, but basically the idea is the, uh, trying to address these, uh, these requests from users and, some, and admins to make things uh, work. We, at least in our, in our QKD uh, environment, and I guess that in general principles are the same, we have identified three planes. One on the, that, has to deal with how quantum signals are forwarded from one point to another, according to the protocol that uh, has, a, has to be applied. 
a service overlay in which you are, in the case of QKD, what you're, you're managing the keys, managing the keys, and it's taking care of the routing of the, uh, of the application-oriented uh, um, um, elements and applying for control and management or uh, and supervision that is in charge of the uh, of the man of, well of the management and control of the network as it, as it has a name. This is how we are now working in in, in uh, making the deployment of our QKDs uh, of QKD infrastructures, and I believe that in general is something that would match most of the uh, current uh, action. Can you move on? But the idea is to somehow generalize this is that uh, some of the properties uh, or some of the uh, issues that are related with QKD, even when it comes to control and management, et cetera, are currently very much focused on, the, on those aspects. And for this, we found that, uh, well, there is a, um, um, an RFC, this uh, 8597, that uh, discusses about the application of SDN in general. It's a, it's a reference framework for the application of SDN. And it's structured around, around this idea of a, of, a, of a stratum that includes several planes that are replicated uh, um, consistently across the different stratum and try to um, integrate control mechanisms and the interplay, um, the, the interplay among the different elements in the stratum, in the, in the strata, and uh, trying to address, uh, well, the, uh, the general trends that we perceive right now in network, the, in network infrastructure and management regarding the application of cloud nativeness, the, uh, the idea of uh, automation, intent, etc. The idea is to leverage and to better understand how you can build a network oriented to a, a set of services and focus on this, uh, on this uh, disaggregation and, and software-based uh, control. And this, what you have there is that there is a service stratum a compute stratum and a connectivity stratum. The idea is that the compute has some components that are integrated in the network and support some, some le level of computation. Can you move on? Based on this, I'm taking, I'm taking into account this previous experience of the three planes I was mentioning, et cetera. The proposal that you, that you have in on the draft is to consider three, uh, three of these strata for the, um, for the quantum networks. One focus on service that uh, will we'll deal with the, uh, with the particular functionality for a quantum network. A quantum network, in general, would be a part of the quantum internet in the future. And the idea is that, uh, well, currently, and the one we have experience with is the, how we can generate and manage keys using QKD. But in the future, we can think about other environments with other, with other focus, like time synchronization, identity, sensing, whatever with a, a general goal of the, uh, the entanglement distribution. Again, it's about a quantum forwarding strat stratum that takes, takes care of the, of the quantum mechanisms and that the the, isolates the fact that the technologies that are currently in use are not necessarily, even for the same purpose, are not necessarily uh, aligned. You know, right now, our experience is that each different vendor for a quantum link, for a QKD link, you have to use the both the same vendor on both uh, both extremes because they're using different protocols, different mechanisms, different ways of uh, of, of measuring and and, up, and deriving the uh, the bits for the keys. <clears throat> and between any two endpoints of the quantum link, even thinking about that, we have some kind of repeater, whatever the nature of the repeater, whether it's a quantum memory or something that would appear in the future. And finally, something that is equally important because in all the proposals we have been seeing, etc., is very the assumption that the connectivity is there, the, I mean, the physical connectivity is there, is, uh, is made, and something that is Essential, if we want to have a network scale, is that we have certain capacity of managing the connectivity mechanisms at the same time we are dealing with the, uh, with the quantum protocol, etc. I mean, the physical, the uh, guaranteeing that, uh, that the fiber connection is from point A to, a to point B. And, and the management of this, being aware of the, uh, request, uh, the requirements of the, uh, of the quantum forwarding is uh, what takes care of the uh, connectivity stratum that typically would be 
made on the, uh, by, by optical transport. And it should be intended to allocate the current circuit-based approaches, commuting if uh, switching, because it would be necessary in the future, or even thinking about new proposals like uh, one that has been recently made on, on packet-like approach. Can you move on? And I think this is the, uh, well, this is a, as a summary. So what, it, what we have proposed and is on the draft is this idea of incorporating this uh, recent experience with the deployment of uh, QKD networks, adding some uh, additional degrees of freedom so we can uh, generalize and make the, the, the whole thing more, more uh, applicable in other cases. And that includes the uh, having independent resolved and control planes at, at each uh, stratum so you can think and you can abstract at the different, taking into account the, uh, the different um, um, goals, so apply SDM principles, and this is the nature, the very nature of the original class proposal, and support whatever the aggregation patterns of, of models for collaboration that is. Uh, so that implies that the uh, framework is very much focused on this principle of the agility, being able to adapt to technology evolution, is uh, trying to incorporate all the current trends in network automation, network management, uh, et cetera. And it could allocate, easily allocate the use if you want to use AI or, or intent or whatever is the buzzword of, of the week to, uh, to incorporate it uh, there. And uh, taking into account the need that the physical connectivity, the management of the physical connectivity has to be part of the, of the of the network management from the quantum network perspective and how this interaction happens. And this is uh, trying to address the, uh, the idea of the uh, of quarantine sustainability and the, and, the, um, and, the, and the future scale of the network. With this, the last one, please. Uh, wait a with this, if, uh, if uh, well, the idea is to continue working, the, the document right now has a couple of sections that uh, should be one of the, well, should be the biggest in the document that has a TBD. One is about identifying current proposals on interfaces and protocols and allocate them in the, uh, allocate them within the, uh, the framework that is proposed and identify which are potential gaps that can be filled. And again, this is not intended to be the final solution, and once we say this protocol could be useful for routing and the quantum forwarding plane, is going to be the, the protocol that, uh, because among other things, I believe that uh, for, a, for a research group, the idea is to identify it and to classify, which are the, uh, from this perspective, is about to classify which is the potential fit of, uh, of any proposal in the, uh, in the framework and the potential interactions, then in the moment that we, we, we need to start really standardizing and defining a particular, particular goals, et cetera, would be the moment of providing direct solutions. Something that uh, we are considering as well is exploring uh, the implementation side, for sure, as anything that has to do with uh, quantum right now is something that you cannot do full scale a combination of uh, some real stuff, some emulated and simulated components. And uh, we have started working, one of the, uh, of the authors is uh, working on, uh, on uh, the idea of building a quantum um, network digital twin to make uh, experiments and try to uh, plug and unplug different elements, whether simulated, emulated, or, or real. And well, for sure, gather your comments and see what uh, uh, the, see whether you find this useful and we can move on in, in providing a reference for the, uh, for the coming uh, quantum internet. Um, that's all. All right, that leaves us just about three minutes for, for uh, questions and comments. We can also take them later at, uh, you know, at the end of the session, but, but if you have questions now, now is a good time to ask them. I don't see anyone in the queue yet. <clears throat> Shota, you did not put your hand up in the queuing, uh, <laughs> the online tool. Well, so can I speak? Okay. Um, so, oh, um, uh, I'm Shoto Nagayama from Keio University. So I'm not convinced a QKD network is a related to quantum internet still. So the QKD network is actually a 
classical computer network, uh, which has a quantum link. So the quantum is only existing as a fibers. And uh, the functionality in computers is uh, realized by classical computers. And uh, in, uh, so the meanwhile, the quantum internet is a quantum computer network. So there is a big difference that the classical computers can copy data. So in this case, the classical digital keys can be copied and uh, retransmitted, uh, can be retransmitted. And, but uh, in quantum internet case, uh, we cannot make backup and retransmit. So the, still, I'm not convinced about uh, the you're, relationship. You're not convinced about that we need quantum communications? We, we need quantum communication. I agree with that. But the architecture of QKD network I think it should not be related to the quantum internet architecture. Uh, so the protocol stack will differ. No, I mean, no, no, that the protocol, mm -hmm. pro when we're talking about the quantum internet, I assume that we're not talking, I mean, I'm not talking about quantum IP, quantum mm -hmm. TCP, quantum mm -hmm. quick, mm -hmm. no. That, that's precisely the idea. And mm -hmm. that's precisely this is intentional focus on, on the function of each one of, mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. of the stratum. We're talking about a stratum that mm. has to do with quantum forwarding. It's about sharing how you share the quantum states. Mm -hmm. A stratum that is concerned about how you establish the physical connectivity that you, mm -hmm. you require for this. And a stratum that is concerned about what is the goal of what you're doing that will take care of the, of the, of the management of that goal. So that's why, I mean, in that, in that respect, the document and the, and the idea doesn't advocate for a particular protocol or follow packet switching approach or, or follow, uh, I don't know, I mean, that we're using a format addressing mm. or not, or instead mm -hmm. of addressing, we are talking about a, a different way of identifying the endpoints. This is, this is precisely open. That right now, at this stage, what they're trying to is to divide functionally and to understand which are the essential functions that would be required. There is, again, let me say this, there are a number of proposals out there on how to build certain relationships among, uh, for, for guaranteeing quantum interactions uh, across the network, and the idea is to locate them and see that, as I believe, that mm. all of them would fit in one of these straight on, uh, strata and, and belong there. Whether they are going to be based on a, on a particular way that mimics the current internet, or are we talking about a, to a totally different one? Mm -hmm. I have no opinion. But something that is important is that on the side of the connectivity, the pure connectivity thing, you have to take care of the physical connections. Yes. And the physical connections is about, let me say, I have point A, point B, I have a fiber network, I have to make a way in which signals will go from A to B. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is not very quantum, this is purely classical way of, uh, but it has requirements, it has to deal with the quantum. Mm -hmm. And when it com with, comes with to the service, it's the same. If I, I'm trying to make a quantum clock synchronization, what I'm interested, again, it's not on the quantum signals. If I'm a user, I'm, I'm interested on how long it would take to synchronize my, my two clocks. And you have to take care of this. And that has to be, be considered inside the quantum internet the same way that when we're talking in the classical internet, we are concerned about video or we are concerned about the, uh, uh, the uh, length of files or whatever, which is not about moving packets around, but is important. That's, that, that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the idea. Oh, okay, um, thank you. So maybe it's time. Because so. the time is up. Yeah. Can I encourage you guys to, to pick it up afterwards? Uh, I think this is a bigger yeah. conversation, and I'd also like to participate as well, for example, myself. So thank you, okay. Diego. Thank you. Can we invite the next speaker, please, uh, Martin? And for those of you who came in uh, late, including Shota, rem please remember to use the online tool to uh, raise your hand uh, to get in the Q&A queue. That helps the, uh, the, the note loggers, among others. All right, hello to another. So my name is Martin Stimmerling, um, as printed both here, but that's not work done solely by me, but also by Malte Bauch, Johanna Henrich, and Fabian Seidel. And Fabian Seidel should also be printed both because he will show a demonstration at the end of the presentation. Um, so please, next slide. Uh, next slide. So this is about, first of all, we are sponsored by, um, the next slide, please. Oh. Right, sorry. Oh, next slide, so too many interruptions, yeah. So um, we have a, a project which is called the Demodunt DT project, uh, and the goal is to set up a quantum key distribution network, even I've heard it's like quantum init, but I think it's like maybe the first step towards this. Uh, in Germany, if running from, from Bonn to Berlin, which is roughly 600 kilometers, uh, 
will be a multi-hop quantum key distribution network. And the intention is to use multiple different vendors uh, for the different quantum uh, distribution segments. So we have a number of partners like Atba, Deutsche Telekom, us from Darmstadt, uh, the Technical University of Darmstadt, Tikon, and Rot and Schwarz. And we are funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, let me keep going for, I think, two slides ahead. Let's see. Uh, right. So um, controlling QPD and So we have heard there's the physical layer, but I have to admit um, I'm a computer science guy and I'm new to the game and I like to play with new toys. <laughs> and <laughs> the thing here is so we can see we have a quantum link we can use to exchange uh, secrets between two endpoints. Um, but on one way, we have the physics which is limiting the reach. So we need to find a way to concatenate, concatenate different links and the forward a user key from one end to the other end. And for this, we are relying on those uh, key management systems, which retrieves the key from the quantum links, uh, looks for the key management, which is, okay, is the key actually suitable for my needs, and the forwarding of the secret, which is encrypted. Uh, the bigger question, if you have a, such a big network, um, how to actually control the network, yeah? You have multiple quantum links, um, and for this, we do mainly network management. Uh, we have the key management systems for key routing and forwarding. And in our case, we use a centralized SDN controller who is keeping track of the, of the network, trying to find out, okay, how is the network actually behaving right now and how can I satisfy any type of service request to the network? And then this routing calculation on which path to take is calculated by the SDN controller. And uh, I think in one of the documents I read the discussion between circuit switch, not circuit switch, and what we right now do is like circuit switch. And the reason is uh, we want to do it easy at the beginning and to learn all the different problems you can run into it. And later on, we can think about going away from circuit switch to maybe something else. Yeah? Um, we have some limitations. So let's place in the Deutsche Telekom carrier network. And Diego already pointed out uh, that it's not that easy sometimes because you have to deal with network management people, getting fibers and other things. Um, and the intention is to deploy it first of all, uh, which is currently being done, and then study a countrywide behavior of the quantum key distribution network with all bells and whistles, everything can learn about the rates you get from key exchanges, what the network management people tell you, what's happening to the fibers, if they're actually working or not. And additionally, what's happening in our settings is we have the classical separation of the user part of the network, which is shielded away from the carrier network part by the access network. So this mimics the traditional view of a carrier network. Okay, keep moving forward. So this is the system architecture, which is extremely simplified. Uh, on the top left and right, you have the user sites uh, with a network termination. That's typical. We have encryptors and decryptors sitting, and they need keys for the encryption decryption process. And then you see on the very left side, uh, the user key management system. That's the user side. Maybe that's in the bank building, uh, government agency, maybe in 20 years at your home. Uh, and this is the first part where you want to forward a secret key, which was running first of all to an access node, which is the AKMS. And then you have the core uh, key management systems that's actually in the core of the network, which is then handling maybe not one key forwarding process, but maybe a million ones per second at the good days. Uh, on the lower, you have the uh, segments um, with the quantum links. And on top of that, in, here in the data center, but doesn't actually matter, you have the quantum key distribution controller, we still have a quantum key distribution network manager because it's a network management people, AAA, and so all the functions you need to run uh, an operator network. Yeah. All right, uh, then keep going to the next slide. Um, so we are new to the business, so we thought, okay, let's start playing with the equipment. And we started implementing a very simplistic, if not naive, system. And you see on top of this, uh, it's an SDN, Software Defined Networking Architecture. We have a routing app. And at this point, the routing app is knowing, OK, it has one path. And you can tell it, switch the path. And then you manually can tell it, use the backup path. So there's no magic right now. But that's a part where we're currently working on. We have a controller, which based on our own SDN controller, Go SDN. We have an interface between, and that's also where Diego was talking about, like interfaces in the system, um, which we're using right now GNMI, and we're using a self-developed Young model. Uh, we are not using the Etsy model because we have some problems with the Etsy model, uh, and we said, okay, let's try to make our shot. We have our own key management system, is the Proto KMS, which is a very simplistic implementation of a key management system. And we're using this also not on the prototype, but also for teaching. And we have, uh, since getting 
hands-on on a quantum link is sometimes not that easy. A very plain uh, emulation of a quantum link, which is just gen generating random numbers, shipping it to the other end, we're using this. Don't use it in reality, it's not safe at all. And we put this all into, um, maybe some people know this, it's called Container Lab. This allows you to run on Docker uh, emulated networks, and this is where you placed everything and use this as a system emulator. And that's also something you can see afterwards in the demonstration. And all the code is currently open source. Some of the things you see today, they are not yet in the open source part because we have to polish them a bit. Uh, but we're moving forward. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now or just come by later on and ask me uh, or Fabian. All right. So, um, yeah. Oh, I'm summary in Outlook. So I'm a bit faster than they expected. So what we try is we have a really native implementation of parts of the quantum field decision networks. And what we assume as computer science guys, the quantum links are deployed. Uh, we get our numbers. We can learn about the state of the system right now, if it works. Uh, we have tons of questions about this. Um, we are working on a number of research questions, like, OK, what is the actually behavior of a nationwide network for quantum key distribution. Yeah? Do we see daily patterns? What are dropout rates? Uh, how long will it take until the whole network is actually ready to serve requests? Then one question is, um, how safe are actually, or secure better, quantum links in real networks? So now you can say, well, theoretically, from the physics, they are safe that people can sneak in in the middle. But security, for instance, keeps also in mind availability. Yeah? So what is the best network to you if it's only available 20 hours a day? Yeah? or maybe not at the time when you need it, right? Um, then there are other questions, especially in Germany, in the uh, security community, uh, community, but maybe elsewhere, there's a discussion about, is quantum uh, random numbers safe enough to do encryption, or do we need a mixture of post-quantum cryptography together? It's called key hybridization. Um, and the discussion we also have in the project always is like, okay, are we really sure that we need centralized control, or can we have a decentralized control and routing, but that's like a classical question we probably come about. So the outlook is um, we, the deployment of the hardware and all the systems you described here will happen in 2024 from Bonn to Berlin. We have currently a project running, which is authentication of neighboring no uh, nodes with uh, Wigman Carter hashes. So we don't need any um, preset certificates. We just take the random numbers we have. Uh, but right now it's just a theoretical study and the assumptions that we're going to start implementing this and testing this early next year. And what we show on the demo right now, it's called the, the system emulator, because uh, I think most of the people just don't have a quantum network in their basement they can play with. Uh, maybe some guys have. Uh, uh, but to get hands on for people trying to work with this, ask research questions, and also what we try to get this into hit the hands of computer science students quite fast to say, look, that's an emulator. You can play with that one. And the intention is also to have better link emulations in the, in, over the time. Right now, a set is just like quantum uh, random numbers. There's no quantum below that. And um, for us also, since we have a real network, hopefully soon, to couple the emulation with the real network so we can get real data into the emulation, play with around it, and maybe feedback some of the non-quantum things back into the control band from the live QGDN emulation. Yeah? OK, then I would say if you have questions about this, you can ask this. In the meantime, Fabian can come up and prepare the demo. And the demo is actually showing roughly what we've implemented with the SDN controller, the prototypical key management system, and is using this really easy, naive um, quantum link emulation. Thank you. While he's preparing the uh, demo here, we have one question from uh, Massimiliano. Hello, hi. Uh, Max Pala from Cable Labs. Actually, you brought up a very good point about the security of these devices. That's one thing that we always look into. Um, so especially uh, with the lack of certification programs, et cetera, already running, how are you going to evaluate the real security of these devices? How they actually uh, withstand attacks that we know are possible? We don't know yet, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at this, and it's, it's giving us a bit of heart, a headache because it's like you have a completely new uh, link layer technology. You have all the regular headaches about secure software development, testing, attestation. So uh, we, um, until now, we're just hacking and saying it's, like, it's safe, but it's not. But I, I think that's something we will get to in the next year 
when we come up uh, over this uh, steep hill in the beginning saying, okay, we have a press system you can work with, and then we're going back to, and, and then we can talk about this afterwards also offline, like how to yeah. get to this, yeah, thanks. All right, and the demo from Fabian. Hello, my name is Fabian Seidel. Um, so um, what we can see here is like the demonstration that we built in, um, which is run in a container lab, as Martin already said. And um, the QKD modules, you can see these are the, the emulations of the QKD modules which produce just some random numbers, which we use as these, for example. And then I'm going to turn them off um, to, to make it a bit more, more nicely visible, I guess. And, so um, what's, what's the difference between the types of lines? Um, the, the, the animation was just between these QKD models and it's supposed to show that there's some activity between them exchanging numbers, generating keys, for example. So the uh, dots that were flowing represent uh, the exchange of, of keys using QKD? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And now we can only see the, um, the key management systems and the controller on the bottom, um, which kind of is located in Bragg. And the uh, key management systems are uh, from from a from locations from Bonn to Berlin, for example. And um, what I can do now is like um, on the left hand side we have this um, hex field where I can enter a secret, which we can then transport from one of the nodes to the other end node. And what you will see is like um, popping up a little in information and uh, animation showing that the message I put in uh, gets um, uh, forwarded to the end node. And um, on the left-hand side, we can also see some information uh, showing like the keys that I use or the, that the um, secret I send gets encrypted and decrypted all the time. Um, this kind of information doesn't get exposed in the end in the real uh, um, uh, system that gets implemented, but for now we did this for the demonstration. And what I can do now still uh, also is like turning off one of the links in one of the uh, key management systems. For example, here can you see uh, some kind of information that we can retrieve from the um, key management systems via GNMI and Young. And I turned off one of the links now, which is also like demonstrated with a red link now. And if I send now uh, the secret message again, this gets uh, forwarded via the bottom path because the, the upper path is not available anymore. And uh, this is like the kind of rerouting that we did in this situation. Yeah. Oh, and we implemented some five second delay just for demonstration purposes, uh, actually would, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't see anything of this uh, forwarding process because it would be within a few milliseconds. Yeah. All right, that's so what's, what's the encryption mechanism that's being used here? Martin might have said, but I missed it if he did. Yes. So, uh, not uh, not one time pad, Pardon? not one time pad. No, not one. Right. So but AES with keys generated by the QKD. Yeah. Okay. But because it also you use OTP. And I said like the the KMS is like a extremely fast hacky implementation to see something working. Um, there's more to come and also other encryption methods. Yeah. All right, we have a question from from the floor, Scott Scott Fleur. Uh, Scott Fluor, Cisco Systems. I've got an obnoxious can you, question. Can you speak a little closer to the okay. mic? Okay. I know that's a little harder okay. for you than it is for some people. Okay. Uh, Scott Fluor, Cisco Systems. Uh, obnoxious question. Uh, I believe the QKD networks you're currently using are measure, uh, prepare, and measure. Right. Um, any real uh, QKD network or quantum internet will need to be entanglement based. How certain are you that the lessons you're learning on the current networks will be applicable to the real ones? The good answer is we have uh, partners in Darmstadt from the Technical University 
they have uh, on the technical neurosity of Darmstadt, which is our, we have like multiple neurons in one place, they have an entangle, entanglement based uh, system running. And we're actually working with right now with them together to see uh, what can we run on their system? What can we learn there? So it's like running in parallel. So it's not like we do prepare measure right now and then sometimes later, but we do it in parallel, but not in, not in this project, but it's like a, a side activity. Yeah. Other questions? Comments? Complaints? All right. Criticisms? <laughs> no one else? Martin and Fabian have fled the scene. All right, so who's up next? Uh, next is, uh, thanks a lot, um, uh, Martin. Uh, next is Davida and Paul from, uh, I'll let them say, I forgot. Okay, the floor is yours. Can we start? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is David Alicalsi. This is Paul Paul. We're both PhD students from TU Munich. And today we will present some concerns and threats to quantum cryptography in presence of losses. In the next slide, you can see a short summary of today's agenda. But without further ado, let's start. So we come this slide, uh, from a research group called TQSD. We work on the theoretical foundations on quantum systems. Here is um, a subset of the research directions we're carrying out in parallel. We're strongly focused on simulation emulation of hybrid communication networks. We research and investigate how to achieve high data rates and reliable communication using quantum resources such as entanglement. And last but not least, we work on quantum cryptography. In the next slides, you can see also a sub-list of the several projects we are involved in. QTOC is a project about quantum token-based authentication and secure data storage. And it's actually part of a bigger nationwide project called the Grand Challenge of Quantum Communication, whose goal is the development of quantum memories in collaboration with several other projects. We also work on QDCAM Nets in collaboration with Theo Dresden. The main goal of QDCAM Nets is building and using a quantum internet demonstrator with three nodes. And last but not least, Prophecy investigates the use of quantum technologies for physical layer service integration. Today, I mentioned specifically these three projects because the work that we did for them provide useful insights to the topics I will present today. Next, uh, please. So I will now leave the floor to Paul, who will explain why losses will happen and are bound to happen in quantum communication. Then I will explain how this can affect some quantum cryptography protocols. So, also hello from my side. Um, as you can see, uh, I will talk about the limits we are um, constrained with, basically uh, on the physical side. Um, so, from quantum mechanics, we know that uh, we cannot measure an arbitrary state without altering it. And probably most of you know the no cloning theorem, which means that we cannot copy an arbitrary state. And this means we cannot do copy and retransmission as we are used to in the classic case. Um, and the case is in some applications, we don't even know what qubit we want to send. So, I mean, for example, in DD84 QKD, we know it. But, uh, for example, if we have a quantum money bill, the owner of the bill doesn't even know what uh, qubit they want to send. Um, and sometimes even nobody knows the state, for example, for a um, quantum physical unclonable function, so QPath based quantum token, for example. Um, and on the one hand, this would uh, prevent the malicious cloning of um, states. But on the other hand, this means if we have a um, loss in the link, then we cannot do anything. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, exactly. So. Um, now about what we have in the physical reality. If we have a fiber, for example, we um, have losses due to bending, impurities, uh, splicing and the connections and so on, which lead to absorption and scattering. But um, 
even if we would have a perfectly straight fiber, which is uh, like uh, has no imperfections and stuff, we have intrinsic properties of the materials which uh, lead us to have absorption. Um, and it may be imp um, implementation specific if this absorption may be a problem or not um, and affect qubit uh, loss. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you can see here, we have um, for a standard silica fiber, we have um, absorption even for the global maximum, uh, minimum, I mean, um, at around 15, 15 nanometers, we have a attenuation. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, which is uh, kind of, yeah, intrinsic in the material, which means we cannot really get rid of it at all. Um, yeah, that's basically uh, a big deal. Nobody is really considering in the theoretical case, at least. So uh, next slide, please. Um, other things are dispersion and broadening effects because we have a, so dispersion means we have a wavelength dependency uh, of the propagation speed. And in reality, we don't have a perfectly narrow line width, which means uh, due to thermal and intrinsic effects, which means that we have temporal broadening effects, which means uh, also that the uh, optical hardware um, doesn't really, uh, is not really agnostic to this, let's say. Um, and this can lead to the um, degraded indistinguishability of a photon, which means we cannot uh, uh, be sure that a quantum operation will succeed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and also not only in the real link, but also in the transaction from a flying to a um, stationary qubit, we have actually um, losses which may occur because um, but those, those are uh, highly dependent on the implementation, but uh, because this is uh, most of the time light matter interaction, we can most often describe it as uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, which uh, models is at the, this, uh, this uh, the stationary qubit as a two level system in a resonator and the light entering the cavity would be the flying qubit. Um, next slide. Um, this is basically a um, problem which which led us to to um, a solution, which is also um, applicable through uh, cryptography, which is not uh, my part anymore, but Davides, which I will let him talk about now. Thank you, Paul. So, with that in mind, let's talk a bit about cryptography. Now, cryptography on its own is a bit of a buzzword. It's a very broad field. So, for sake of time, we will focus on some primitives today. We will focus on public encryption and digital signature, identity authentication, and one out of two obvious transfer. Perhaps this last primitive is a bit unknown and, and bizarre, so let's talk about it. In one out of two oblivious transfer, Alice is assumed to have two messages, M0 and M1, and Bob must choose one of them to receive. Now, the underlying assumption is that Bob does not trust Alice and vice versa. Despite this, they want to achieve the following. They want to ensure that Alice is unable to guess Bob's choice. At the same time, they want to ensure that Bob only receives the chosen message and that only gains negligible information on the other one. Now, for each of these primitives, we will consider some quantum cryptography proposals and analyze them in presence of message losses. So, please, next slide. Okay, this is a public key cryptography crypto scheme uh, using quantum public keys to encrypt a classical message. They are combined. Each encryption consumes a quantum public key and transforms it into a quantum ciphertext. The letter is then sent to the receiver who can use this classical private key to decrypt it. Now, mostly we will focus on the key per generation because that is where the vulnerabilities lie. Here I provided an example using four bits numbers. So the private key consists of four integers that are just uniformly random. You then turn them into angles by dividing by two to the power of the available bits times pi. Then you prepare four qubits in the cat zero state and rotate them by the um, above angles. And encryption and decryption also happen by qubit rotations. What is important in this case is that the author himself specifies that if you have enough copies of the quantum public key, using some measurements, you can leak the private key. So they impose that only a limited number of copies should be distributed. but Please, uh, next slide. Let's assume that losses are possible. And let's assume that some user claims that a quantum public key, a copy of the quantum public key was lost. 
Well, here you can see we prepared a four by four table in which we list all the possible cases. Now, if you trust them and indeed believe that it was a loss due to noise and imperfections, well, if you're right, you can resend the key and nothing really happens. But if you trust them and instead somebody intercepted the key, stole it, or maybe the user is cheating because they want more copies of the key, then by retransmitting, you give them extra copies of the public key. And by repeating this over time, they can get enough copies of the public key to learn the private key. So this leads to a security threat. Now, you can also be pessimistic and always believe that somebody has intercepted the key. Well, if you're right, that's fine. You refuse retransmission and you successfully prevent an attack. But if you're wrong, and indeed it was due, some, due to some fault, then by refusing to send the quantum public key, then you know, users who have lost the key can no longer encrypt messages for you. And this will lead to a correctness violation. Please, next slide. We found a similar problem in a digital signature scheme by Gottesman and Chang. They also have a private key that is classical, and from that they derive a quantum public key. And they also impose that there should be limited copies of the quantum public key. Otherwise, you can leak the corresponding private key. And we're also investigating. There might be other protocols that are vulnerable to this, and I'll let you know if we find something else. Then moving on to authentication, please consider this protocol. This is a simplified version of this authentication protocol by Hong et al. So it is assumed that Alice and Bob pre-share a classical key, and they want to exchange qubits to verify that Alice's key equals Bob's key. Now, for this purpose, they uh, predetermine a set of encoding rules. They encode two classical qubits, two classical bits into one qubit, as you see in the example. Alice encodes these bits in the qubit, sends it to Bob. Bob takes a look at his key, the rules, and then measures in one basis, either the computational or the other basis, and expects some result. For instance, in this case, you see that the authentication is not successful. Now, again, if somebody has multiple copies of this qubit, they can measure it several times and then leak the corresponding private key bits. So, moving to the next slide, what should we do if somebody claims that the qubit was lost, if Bob claims the qubit was lost? Well, again, let's quickly go through the diagonal. If you assume a Benin loss and you're right, that's fine. If you're pessimistic and you're right, that's fine, you avoid an attack. But if you assume a Benin loss and indeed somebody stole the qubit, then the attackers gain multiple copies of the qubit over time, and they can attack the protocol. Sorry? Um, on the other hand, if you are pessimistic, but indeed the qubit was just lost to noise, then refusing to retransmit will just not allow Bob to verify Alice's identity, causing a sort of denial of service. Finally, let's talk about um, oblivious transfer. So we, this next slide, okay. Um, we will talk about the BBCS protocol, which is one of the oldest and most established protocols for quantum oblivious transfer. Now, without going into the details, let's only consider the first phase of the protocol, which is a sort of BB84 key exchange. Alice prepares random bits, encodes them into random bases, sends them to Bob, and then Bob measures them in random bases. Now, of course, Bob will guess some bases, meaning that the classical measure, the classical outcomes that he gets are sometimes equal to Alice's. Sometimes they're different. Or let's say with 50% probability they're different, as you can see in the example. The rest is just classical post-processing and classical communication. Now, because Bob statistically will not guess all bases correctly, he's unable to learn both messages. But again, what happens if some message is lost? In the next slide, you can see we again prepared another table. Now let's just keep the diagonal because it's quite trivial. So if Bob claims that a qubit was lost and you trust him, which is already weird because the assumption is that Alice and Bob do not trust each other, but let's assume you trust him. Well, by retransmitting, Bob gains multiple copies of the qubits and using measurements, he can cheat. On the other hand, if you don't trust Bob, but indeed the qubit was lost, then well, you know, you, the protocol cannot proceed. You cannot terminated. Fortunately, in this case, there is a simple mitigation. In fact, if Bob claims that the qubit was lost, Alice can just regenerate a random bit, encode it in another random basis, and send that qubit. And that is a simple mitigation, usually uh, we 
can consider the overhead of this negligible and preserve security. So we have presented a series of problems and threats. Now, can we mitigate them? In the next and final slide, you can see our proposal. So as explained, some protocols are inherently immune. We already mentioned BBCS, but we also found other proposals that are not so affected by this, such as this authentication protocol by Kanamori et al, where they use random qubit rotations. Uh, teleportation could help because if you teleport a qubit from point A to point B, then it's harder for somebody to intercept it. Also, if an error happens at, um, when sharing entanglement, then you can uh, still recover it, while in some cases for quantum cryptography, it might be harder. And this has already been proposed for other purposes. For instance, uh, in this document that I'm sure the QRG group knows really well, and we could follow this procedure. Some authors also suggested using decoy states. They were first proposed for QKD by Wang well, 20 years ago now. And for instance, Hong, the author of the uh, authentication protocol that we mentioned, proposes using these decoy states. But they're not the silver bullet because they work well against its droppers, but active adversaries are still a threat. They require some information on the channel, which is fine maybe for point-to-point -point links, but in a network, that might not be the case. And the main drawback is that they use a thresholding mechanism to prevent, uh, let's say, lost qubit attacks. But what they do is, if the qubit, the number of lost qubits exceeds the, thresh the threshold, Bob just rejects the authentication. But the adversary has already stolen those qubits, so it's, it's anyway too late now. And that was all for today. Uh, thanks. Thanks for listening. All right, that gives us about four minutes for uh, Q&A. Questions, comments? Arguments, advice, agreements? Scott. Uh, Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. Uh, about your first uh, example about the, the public key encryption, I didn't see how that was public key. Uh, I didn't see a public key in there anywhere. Is, is this actually symmetric encryption? So you didn't see can oh. you repeat the last part of the okay. question? Uh, about your first example about the public key encryption, uh, it didn't look like to me to be public key. I understand, I understand your question because also the first time I read that paper, I was mm -hmm. a bit confused. Now they call it public key because I guess you prepare multiple copies and you disseminate them, but it's not a public key in the same, in the classical sense because okay. classically you have a public key, mm -hmm. you just, share it with everybody, yeah. everybody has access, you can copy an arbitrary high number of times. Here, it's, they call it public key, I guess, because you prepare several copies and share it with several parties. In that sense, they call it yeah. public. Yeah, it sounds like both, both the encryptor and the decryptor needs a, the private key, so it's not really public key. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. you're going to cut the, oh, since uh, Scott yeah, was, was up, I, I took the opportunity. Diego Lopez, this is um, thinking about it and thinking what Max was asking before about the idea of the certification, etc. Do you believe that this could be a, a first step into precisely being able to make some kind of a security assessment of, quant of QKD protocols? Because for me, it's it's been in the back of my head for for a long, long time. The difficulty that we have to validate the protocols and validate the implementations. I don't know. I mean, if you have uh, in mind to continue this work, this handling of work is something that uh, you are considering that is just a, a this piece. Uh, I, I, I would like to encourage you to to consider this as a as a line of working uh, in, in analyzing protocols, uh, the, the QKD protocols, because it's quite interesting in that sense. No, this is actually an ongoing work. So the protocols that I mentioned today is what we have investigated so far. We plan on going further and analyzing more and more protocols, other authentication protocols that have different paradigms and possibly other primitives. So of course, we would like to go more in depth and possibly extend the work. It would be very interesting, at least to me. And I think no, but it's, uh, let me say, it's good that because it's a typical argument you can use with classical cryptographers that, no, no, you don't have way of proving, of proving security. Well, this is, is, is a first step, and I'm really glad to see it. Just a...
Other questions? Uh, just a comment. I'm mean, Jinyuk Choi from, we are in the same team. Uh, right now we are also working on QKD, but we are also working on uh, authentication system based on quantum token. Just a comment. Other questions, comments? If not, uh, let's thank the speakers. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Marcella as the next speaker, please? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, let's go to the next slide. You have to speak very close. To the okay. Slide. So yes, look at this. Look at this. No, no, not that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm here to receive your negative feedbacks. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead with the next slide. So, with our research group, we are working on entangled networks. Why the the uh, we have you have here actually why what, how, and blah, blah, blah. So what is the topic of this presentation, which is a protocol stack, quantum internet protocol stack, okay? And since there was a discussion about QKD, uh, can you move to the next slide? This is the test bed that we are um, setting up in Naples, and when there is the question about how much can we learn from QKD when we switch to entangled-based networks, well, all from this point to this point, if you have just one link and you forget the second link, fiber detectors, polarization controllers, everything in there, all the experience from QKD, you can recover and switch for entangled based networks. Of course, you don't have a single photon source, you have an entangled uh, photon source, which is a pain, but still there is a lot of uh, benefits uh, for, for people like us, which works on entangled based networks and lessons that we have to learn from people on working on QKD. Now, next slide. Of, okay, the, the, this topic or this speech is about this paper, which is called Quantum Internet Addressing. Uh, next slide. So, okay, this. This picture is from IETF 51, August 2001. And the speech was from Steve Deerings, and the issue was about how glass waste of classical protocol stack. So the issue here, oh well, the benefits here is that IP, and TCP, but IP won the evolution race, which is good, right? Now, if you can move to the next slide, well, it's not good from our perspective. Why? Because IP and TCP has been frozen for 40 years. Here you have the, we, we were searching this for this presentation. You have a picture uh, for TCP IP implementation. I will say that this is very close to actual implementation, which dated 1979. And there were not yet IBM uh, personal computer, but we were stuck in the mainframe world with IBM 360. So uh, IP haven't been evolved in the last 40 years. Can you go to the next slide? Well, what's the issue with IP? Nothing. If we look at classical networks, not, nothing. IP tried to solve two, two big problems. One is addressing and the second is fragmentation and we are focusing on addressing. So what is IP providing for addressing classical networks? A separation between name, address, and route, okay? So what is a name, what we seek, and the address is where the resource that we are searching for is located. Uh, next slide. Now, and this is all classical, right? You have a source or an intermediate node, you want to reach the destination. And there is a clear 
progress toward the destination. Why? Because there is only one destination. Okay, there can be multicast, but let's forget about multicast. Let's consider unicast. And you usually try to send a datagram and to reach the destination, and the good benefits of IP, it provides scalability. Scalability in the sense that routing tables are compact, okay? Next slide. Now, um, what about quantum networks? Well, existing proposal about entangled-based quantum networks limits quantumness in the message. So we have a quantum message, and the quantum message must be distributed. Now, the quantum message can be a qubit, can be entanglement, can be a non-local correlation, whatever. But existing proposals are, are trying to mimic existing routing procedures in accomplishing the fundamental task of quantum networks. Now, which is the fundamental task of quantum networks? Next slide. Well, now, I will not say that what we have to achieve is to reach destination. What we have to achieve from a routing perspective in the quantum internet is entangling with the destination. As long as I have an entanglement shared with the destination, I can do whatever I want. Now, what if very long-term vision, we have proactive entanglement distribution? Well, in that case, the intermediate node doesn't need to reach the destination. He, for him or for her, the goal is to reach a node which is already entangled with the destination, right? So it's when you see at the entanglement and when you see be part of the entanglement, you start to see some differences. You don't want to reach the destination. You want to be entangled with the destination. And this is a different communication functionality, fundamentally different communication functionality. And next slide, if you start having multi-party entanglement within the picture, well, you don't have a destination, a single destination. Why? Because any of the nodes that share multi-party entanglement are gateways to reach your destination, okay? Now, I understand that we can deal with the multi-party entanglement by using existing classical protocols, right? But what if we start being more radically? What if we are trying to change the fundamental assumptions that drove classical internet design for the sake of what? What's the main goal here? Can you go to the next slide? Well, the main goal is we, we can have two different approach. Short-term approach. Let's leverage as much as possible existing classical networks. Why? Because we want to implement testbed and we want to have classical networks supporting quantum functionalities. And this is important but it's short term. Longer term vision will be, what if we radically change the underlying assumption by really exploiting the properties and the unconventional future of entanglement? Why? Because entanglement is not like classical bits. Entanglement is a different resource with different properties. And here we summarize some of the properties you go to the next slide. And in that case, you, when you start investigating entanglement, you start to realize that the same uh, concept of conductivity, which is the basing uh, property that you search for routing changes. Why? But, well, when you have an entanglement-based conductivity, you have a weaker dependence on the instantaneous physical condition, for example, because you don't need to have a channel available as long, a quantum channel available, as long as you had before and you use it for entanglement distribution. You have unconventional temporal dynamics, but even more important, entanglement change at runtime dynamically your neighborhood uh, concept. Why? Because I can simply perform a swapping operation. In that case, I will not be any more entangled with Rod, but I will be entangled with someone else. Uh, what if we use entanglement 
as a resource for solving classical problems, which we are not able to solve with classical information or with classical methods. Next slide. Well, for us, the main, and you remember the hourglass, the main or the common language of classical internet is IP and IP addresses. What if we start and keep embedding an additional level of addressing structure, which is based on quantum addresses rather than classical addresses? Now, I'm not saying that it will provide advantages. What I'm advocating here is that we have a new resource and we should start trying to exploit the new potentialities of this resource for doing something that was not possible to do with classical methods. And I've stopped here. So there is 10 minutes left. Thank you, Marcello. Any questions? You do have one more slide. Do you, what? You do have one more slide. Uh, yes. Do you want the... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Any questions? Scott. Uh, Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. I have no Let's idea speak, what you're... Speak closer to okay. the mic. Okay. Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. I have no idea what sort of things you're suggesting. Could you possibly give an example? An example of, of what? I missed of that. Of what sort of, of, of okay. advantage you hope to have by having some sort of quantumness with the address? Uh, you are asking me if I already solved the problem, meaning that... No, no, no. I'm asking you if you've actually defined... As, uh, give me an example of what the problem might be. <laughs> I can, t I can give you these answers. Once you have entanglement and superposition, mm -hmm. you might have, for example, security, right? With entanglement, you can use QKD uh, mm -hmm. for security. My perspective on having a quantum address will be the following. I will be very curious to investigate whether I can keep tables, routing tables which are compact, scalable, and still be able to represent the full connectivity, the full topological connectivity of the network. Mm -hmm. But this is my personal curiosity about what I would like to do with a quantum address. I think that the, the main or what we were trying to convey here was not that there is, you can use the quantum address for this and that's the solution. What I'm saying is you have a quantum message, right? And you can exchange quantum messages within an entangled network. Not now, but let's think that you have a quantum network. Why do you want to restrict your addressing to be classical? Is there any reason for not trying to explore quantumness at the addressing scheme? Yeah, to me, at least for security, if you want to be secure, you need to know who you're being secure with. Now, if you're saying this is an idea, it might solve something, we don't know what, okay. Is that what you're basically saying? I, I, I didn't hear you. Okay. Are you saying this is a, an idea without a, okay, tell you what. No, no. <laughs> you, you probably have better so far. You don't know what the, no, but, uh, and just uh, try, take the opportunity to taking the opportunity to um, to say that this is one of the uh, things that in the, in the what I was presenting this idea of the having separate uh, stratum. This is a problem for the quantum forwarding staff, and, and and makes sense because it, it I mean it, it makes sense in the because you're you're trying to distribute entanglement. But then what, what, what Scott is, was asking is how you relate it with, uh, with the security properties that you had to, to, that you are not sharing information with a third party that you're not sure about. Precisely the connection between the uh, connectivity stratum and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the quantum forwarding stratum, in my view, is that, that's precisely what we had to discuss. I mean, I would take what... Uh, 
Marcelo has, has been presented, put it in the, uh, say, well, this is quantum forwarding plane. Let's discuss how the addresses in the quantum forwarding plane match with the, with the addresses in the connectivity plane, because at the end, you, you would need physical connection, physical classical connection as well. And you have to connect them and, and make a relation among them, and then you can derive some of the security properties Scott was asking for. Um, so, I think that most of the proposals are focusing on a quantum data plane. Okay, can we agree on this? We have a quantum data plane and we want to distribute qubits over a link. And the control plane that we are developing right now in the test bed or with the simulators, with the papers, is basically classical. Yeah, yeah, that's... Okay, which is perfect fine. I mean, you have classical solutions for classical problems. Now, what I'm saying is that personally, I'm very curious in investigating whether a quantum control plane can provide advantages over a classical control plane. Fully, and I fully agree. The, my, my point is that uh, the connection between, because at the end, you need uh, some kind of classical con connectivity map to... to, to, to uh, can, can you go back to the, the previous slide? You need... <clears throat> Connect. Why do you say, uh, uh, I mean, you, you need physical links. You, you need Definitely. fibers connecting one point to the other. Perfect. Can you still go back to the uh, multi-party entanglement? Yep, here. No, no, here. Okay. So, for example, how do you define the classical connectivity once? I mean, you're saying that you, ne you need to have classical connectivity. You need to have a classical version of quantum connectivity because at the end you need to have quantum links interconnecting devices. And it's true. So I need to have a quantum link between this node and that node. And this can be easily mapped in a classical definition of connectivity. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. once I have distributed EPR here and here, or here and here, whatever, and I start performing swapping, the definition of connectivity changes in the sense that, go ahead. no, no, I, I'm not objecting to that. I agree with that, and I, and I agree that this is a it's a path that is worth exploring. I'm, I'm not saying that is not the case. What I'm saying is that the relationship of these uh, quantum connectivity patterns and the physical. Uh, the, the underlying, uh, you cannot call them physical, the underlying <laughs> fibers connecting them, you have to keep a relationship for preserving these uh, security properties that uh, Scott was mentioning. I, I, I'm not objecting to what you're saying. It's, it's trying to highlight that as well, you have to keep this, uh, I don't know how to say, these, uh, these uh, infrastructural roots to, to reason about the security, etc. Only that. I agree. Okay, so, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, Jin Vogn Choi. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm pr pronouncing your name right. Okay. Uh, currently, IP address represent identity, who I am, and locator, where I am, at the same time. Also, the root uh, encoded in prefix. But in quantum case, it seems the location and connectivity seems more complicated, especially when entanglement came into being. Do you plan to use a different name for identity and location or connectivity for quantum case? We don't know yet. Ah. <laughs> That's the honest answer. Yeah. We're just starting okay. to investigate what is, I mean, maybe the answer will be we don't need any quantum address and classical address are perfectly fine for doing everything that we need. So we are just starting to investigate. Let's suppose that I have a quantum address. Is there any advantage? Of course, I need to convince a, a huge community which has been uh, locked to classical IP address. And if we don't find the right toy model with good advantages, we will never change uh, the current status quo. But what bothered me personally is that how is possible that after 40 years of evolution, we cannot find a better way to solve addressing and routing? This is something that bothered me. I don't have the answer on 
how we can do. What I think still is that we need to start investigating. Mm -hmm. So we need to start searching for new solutions to old problem. I don't know if this yeah. makes sense. I mean, just to comment. I mean, I, when IP address was first designed, it indicated both ID and locator. For quantum case, we'd better make it clear which speak one. A little, speak a little louder. Uh, speak closer to the mic. Uh, for quantum case, uh, it may be better for us to indicate what we refer to, identity or locator or color. So thank you. Shota. Hi, Shota Nagayama is speaking. So uh, I'm not sure I'm fully understand what you mean, but still uh, I would find a distinction uh, between the uh, quantum IP address and uh, quantum routing table. The quantum IP address, so, we, uh, so, the, so let's say the destination is de determined when uh, the measurement uh, is yeah, occurred. And, and uh, so it might help the anonymous communication. Or I'm not sure, but still, uh, it may help the, a kind of the um, quantum cloud computation. We cannot know, you know which node actually our computation is processed, but I'm not sure yet. And uh, so other thing is a quantum routing table. So yeah, you said, I agree with that, that we can compact the routing table with quantum memory. So it, it should be exponentially smaller, but the, so you know the when we retrieve some data from a quantum database, the database is broken. So we have to gather the routing table information from other nodes again. So yeah, that could be a problem, but it might have something. So yeah, so is my understanding, my understanding correct? Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. If you start having quantum addresses and you start having quantum routing tables, mm -hmm. you need quantum algorithms to process those yes. tables uh -huh. and to extract information. Mm -hmm. Now, which kind of algorithm will mm -hmm. provide you an advantage? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Still an open problem. Mm -hmm. How should we map identities within quantum address? Mm -hmm. Open problem. But mm -hmm. uh, think about it in this way. So there was this quantum amplification protocol. It was over there and no one was finding a practical application of the quantum amplification protocol. Then Shore came out and said, okay, we can use for this. So what, what here we are advocating is that we need to have uh, younger researchers and students trying to challenge current uh, internet assumptions. And this is the only way to advance research in the same way that 50 years ago, other person, other researchers before us challenged the circuit switching architecture, right? Before there was this queuing key, theory, which has no practical value. And then there was all the IP and packet switching uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a new resource, quantum. How can we, we use it for running the network? <laughs> That's the, our question. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, with that, I think we need to move on. Um, there's one more questioner in the queue. Greg, uh, can, we, can we postpone yours until, until uh, the Q&A at the end? So we got one more talk to go. Thank you. Thank you, Marcello. Uh, we have one more talk and it's from Ricardo. And final reminder, since we're, we're getting ready to start the last talk here, if you have not signed in via the blue sheet, please do so. Um, I saw a peak of 90 people and that's about the number in the room here. So I think we're doing pretty good. Thank you all for cooperating. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Speak close to the mic. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is uh, Riccardo Bassoli. I'm an assistant professor and uh, head of the quantum group at TU Dresden. And uh, now I want to, let's say, move the perspective uh, in a slightly different way in which we are addressing uh, the problem of designing quantum communication networks, the quantum internet. Uh, next uh, slide. So you can see if we, let's say, zoom out, and we see how the standardization uh, and uh, the design of uh, the major networks paradigms uh, is going on at the moment. 
So we have on one side the design of the quantum internet. And uh, in the case of Europe, uh, we have the flagships, the quantum internet allies. We have all the companies uh, uh, focusing on uh, producing quantum computers. But this is uh, somehow independent from uh, the design and the standardization that has been going on uh, for classical networks. So now we are reaching the finalization of the standardization of the latest releases of 5G. And uh, um, I'm also involved uh, not only in the Quantum Internet Alliance, but also in the flagship, uh, the EU flagship for 6G, XX2. And uh, there we are producing uh, uh, the, let's say, first draft of characteristics uh, for uh, the, the input to 6G standardization in Europe. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, from one side, we have uh, the horizon of 2030, that is uh, the first deployment of 6G. And on the other side, we have to think about the maturity that we will have at that time or close to that time, uh, maybe 2032, 2033. But uh, can uh, the question is, uh, we have a current uh, uh, internet uh, core networks, uh, wired networks, uh, uh, and wireless mobile networks uh, that uh, provide uh, uh, high quality services. They satisfy a lot of needs of companies, uh, users, uh, with very high performances. And we have to think about what is the maturity and the role that quantum technologies can play in the next decade. The next slide. So you see that uh, the question started in 2015 with the Sustainable Development Goals defined by the United Nations. And this uh, uh, is the driver of all the national uh, uh, frameworks of funding in communication networks and also uh, regard defining the performances that are required to future communication networks. So in uh, some uh, international meetings uh, uh, that I had attended, uh, um, the, the politicians that defined the frameworks were also trying to uh, see and monitor what is the percentage uh, of the uh, achievement of these goals uh, that the current networks uh, uh, are providing. And uh, by now, only the 15% of the original percentages uh, of the original KPIs at the moment are satisfied. So you can see that there are economical, uh, societal, uh, and uh, uh, let's say environmental uh, uh, goals and uh, uh, these are the drivers uh, of the funding and the research uh, and the industry worldwide and nationwide. Next slide. So you see that uh, uh, these uh, uh, macro goals uh, are then declined into uh, family groups uh, of use cases. So, for example, you see human in the center, uh, we all know, for example, the metaverse, so the projection of the human into a virtual augmented reality and the interaction with digital twins, uh, the role of uh, the human in industry interacting with machines and, uh, and so on. So we have these macro objectives, macro use cases, families, and then uh, they transfer transfer, they are translated into applications and needs, needs uh, then become a matrix, become KPIs that, uh, that are mapped into the computing, communication, sensing, storage of the infrastructure. So you see that uh, we should also take the perspective of uh, we get the needs from the applications, the requirements that the industry, society has at the moment, the target for 2030 that they have. And we need to see what uh, quantum technology, how quantum technology can answer to these problems. What is the role that in the next decade quantum technologies can have uh, to satisfy these KPIs? Next slide. So you see uh, in, uh, in the vision, uh, uh, this is the European uh, perspective uh, of the EU flagship of, for 6G. So you see that uh, uh, not only uh, the, um, 
we have uh, like uh, qualitative, quantitative KPI. So we have numbers. We want this throughput. We want this end-to-end -end latency. Uh, we want uh, reduction of energy usage mutually satisfied. So for example, thinking about, we have been talking about QKD by now. So QKD provides uh, information theoretic secure uh, key distribution, but uh, what is the cost in terms of energy? What is the throughput, the key generation rate that we can achieve? So uh, currently the discussion in communication networks uh, um, embraces uh, various KPIs at the same uh, time. So it's not like in the past that we want only optimized throughput without considering, for example, latency or other metrics. And then we have also the difficulty of values. So you see that now in 6G, in respect of previous uh, networks, we have trustworthiness, we have inclusion, we have sustainability, these are values, key value indicators are called, that uh, uh, do not directly, um, are not directly described by specific uh, uh, metrics with specific thresholds, but they are, they embrace different metrics uh, together. So for example, if you trust the network, it's not only security, privacy, it's also availability of the resources, is the resilience, so you see the complexity of achieving these metrics, how quantum can play a role in the next decade with the maturity of the technologies that can be provided. Next slide. So you see here some a list of architectural principles related, for example, to uh, some key values indicators uh, like uh, sustainability, trustworthiness, and inclusiveness. So, for example, the full automation of the network. We have uh, before in, uh, in a presentation uh, or in a couple of presentations where uh, mentioned the digital twins uh, of the network. So even this is a quite complex uh, uh, problem because uh, a software uh, description of a quantum network uh, is this uh, in quantum, in classical software. So then means uh, how uh, we model uh, in an accurate way the, the quantum properties, the quantum uh, behavior in classical software. And uh, uh, also you see that uh, there are uh, architectural aspects like uh, scalability that uh, connects uh, somehow to the concept of sustainability. So sometimes uh, uh, I saw some works uh, uh, that were uh, um, pro providing uh, the idea of putting uh, a quantum computer per base station uh, to solve some optimization problems. Actually, currently, the problem to be solved uh, is uh, the opposite, in the sense that operators uh, and uh, industry in classical communication network is softwareizing and moving the computing from the base station to uh, the edge of the network, uh, to the data centers. That's why, for example, the data centers, the big data centers in the cloud and in the edge got uh, quite more attention uh, uh, in the last years. So you see that uh, uh, security and privacy uh, has a big role, but uh, uh, there is the competition also of uh, uh, classical security, post-quantum security, uh, to, to like quantum security. This we have to consider it, because uh, when we provide now uh, quantum resources in terms of computing and security, this is also a stimulus um, a stim a stimuli for uh, the, the classical algorithms to improve and uh, uh, also the, the problem of uh, softwareization of the network and uh, uh, in minimizing uh, the, the cost of the network cost not only in terms of resources to deploy the network because uh, if we think about the complexity of the internet for example if we talk about the internet but also the complexity of uh, like the 6G architecture. We see that we don't have three nodes, four nodes. We have hundreds of nodes. 
with millions of users, millions of sensors. So this is the scenario that we are facing at the moment uh, and uh, that we have to deal with uh, in the current design. The next slide. So this is a, a high level picture of the 6G architecture uh, that uh, we published in the first phase of the EU flagship. So you can see the heterogeneity of the network infrastructure that we have. Uh, embracing uh, practically all uh, the technologies that uh, uh, you see, the physical layer technologies that you see, both in the wireless part and uh, in the uh, hardware uh, wired, sorry, in the wired part, and also embracing uh, uh, partially the internet because uh, when you virtualize, when you softwareize and offload uh, a network function in a cloud data center, Obviously, you, you use also uh, the internet. Uh, so you see that this uh, um, physical infrastructure is abstracted into a softwareized continuum. And this uh, allows uh, uh, the flexible and uh, intelligent management of the network resources uh, autonomously. So this, uh, the idea is to have autonomic networks without human intervention. And uh, a big problem in this is uh, uh, the huge uh, control uh, data that has to be managed. Um, and for this, uh, the, the paradigm of uh, in-network intelligence, uh, uh, the massive uh, usage of uh, AI uh, for network uh, management, uh, reactive, but also predictive in the sense that uh, you try to predict the future states of the network. So this is the, the scenario, let's say, that uh, we will have, uh, uh, let's say, from 2030, but let's say between 2030 and 2035. And uh, in, that is like the concurrent or the parallel scenario to the quantum internet, to QKD, to the quantum technology. Next. So currently, uh, having this uh, um, vision in mind, uh, the, um, the roadmap uh, of, uh, of projects and implementation and investigation that we have uh, with our colleagues from TU Munich, Deutsche Telekom, uh, Leibniz Institute, and other colleagues um, is uh, uh, we are uh, designing and realizing an integrated protocol stack of starting from uh, the edge network and the radio access of 5G and uh, deploying this uh, 5G run and edge. We um, are going, we will have three sites, uh, three nodes, because if we want to talk about networks, uh, we, we need to have at least multiple links, so not only one link. Um, we will have three quantum nodes that will perform uh, operations like entanglement distribution and uh, generation of quantum traffic. And uh, um, this, uh, for example, uh, will be used in the context of a campus quantum 5G network. Um, and you may say why uh, campus networks uh, are important. You see that uh, um, the, there is the logo of SETI. Uh, I'm, in, I'm a member in the Center for Tactile Internet with Human in the Loop. And uh, uh, in order to realize tactile internet, and also one of the biggest problems in 6G is very low latency and ultra-reliable communications for applications in industry and human-machine interaction. And these kind of applications uh, uh, involve mainly campus industrial networks and uh, uh, edge computing. That's why. So, uh, for example, quantum, uh, we identified the applications for uh, ultra precise and reliable synchronization, but also we are investigating new use cases because uh, even the identification of how quantum can help uh, current uh, issues in the 6G design in the support of uh, use cases that are already there to be uh, realized is uh, an open problem. And then uh, this network uh, will be interconnected with quantum networks uh, uh, in Berlin and in Munich with our partners uh, via uh, this uh, uh, fiber network that uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom uses with the partners for research. 
and also we have acquired uh, we have started uh, a recent uh, uh, project last month in which we will uh, um, get the three quantum computers uh, with uh, uh, small uh, uh, processing capabilities obviously um, these compact quantum computers and uh, we will try to uh, let's say integrate them and to see what uh, role they can have uh, uh, to to realize a classical quantum mobile edge cloud uh, so this is uh, the the current uh, uh, roadmap and the infrastructure we will have uh, let's say available and ready uh, in one year uh, uh, one year uh, and something so thanks for your attention and uh, i'm open for questions all right, questions, comments? Dialogue, diatribe, duologue, dissension? All right, I actually have one question, um, just as, as, a, as a personal question. So, um, what do you think the time frame is for this? The time frame, how many years? For implementing your vision here. Uh, the projects are three years. Okay. So now we are, let's say, after the first year. So let's say one year and then half. Wow, that's not a lot of time. <laughs> uh, maybe I missed this, because. but did you mention what the capabilities of these quantum nodes are? Uh, we are uh, um, designing with our uh, uh, partners uh, from the experimental physics uh, department at the Leibniz Institute, the node. Um, the, the platform they will use is uh, sources based on quantum dots, but uh, uh, even the performances in the, the integration with the communication network is not yet clear. So we will test them during the the realization. Other questions? If not, thank you. thank the speaker. Thank you. And last for the agenda is Rodney has a few announcements to make. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll do it up here. Yes, so just a, a quick couple of announcements um, from, from a personal uh, position, not, not as chair of the group. The first one is um, the workshop for quantum repeaters and networks, the, the fourth edition of that, uh, the dates and location have been announced. It will be September 11th to the 13th, 2024 in Montreux, Switzerland. The local host and local organizer for that is uh, the University of Geneva. Um, so the link for that is wqrn.org. Um, the workshop's limited generally to about 100 participants. So, so um, if you're interested, you know, the, uh, please contact us and follow, follow the, uh, you know, the, uh, the announcements on the website. Um, second announcement, and I will send uh, email about this in the QIRG. Well, I'll send email about both of these in the QIRG mailing list uh, shortly. But second announcement. Um, you have probably seen, if you're on the mailing list, I've talked about it a couple of times, we have been writing a, uh, an undergraduate textbook on quantum communications, and it is now out and available on the archive um, in PDF uh, format and also in LaTeX source if, if you want that for some reason or another, and it is licensed Creative Commons. And so uh, quantum communications, 300 page uh, undergraduate textbook, um, by Mikhail Hydrushek and uh, myself with a lot of support and contributions from, from our team. Um, and then the third announcement, what was the third announcement? Ah, uh, yes, the third announcement was um, Shota Nagayama, who's sitting there in the bright sunlight with glorious colors all over him. Um, he and I are considering writing a, uh, a survey paper on routing and quantum uh, networks. And so if you're interested in, in participating in that writing, collaborating with us on that, find either me or Shota and we'll, uh, and we'll work something out. <laughs>
Um, the endpoint of that is not clear. It might be an RFC, but, but more likely it would be a survey paper submitted to an IEEE journal or some, something like that. Um, but that's TBD. That's it. Great. Thanks for that, Rod. And with that, that's a wrap. That's our session. Thank you, everybody. And thanks. Well, we uh, we want to have open to No, but we did. Okay, we can have it. I thought we were. I thought we were doing. Agenda. Agenda. It's not on the agenda. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any final comments or questions before we wrap up? If not, we're done a few minutes early. All right. I guess we're done. <laughs> I thought we were saving that last 10 minutes for, for actual discussion. No, 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 I don't think 10 minutes is like an actual discussion. It's not the actual show. I think we should do it on, offline. Okay. All right, we are good. Yes, sure. We have had some discussions with people, so it's actually it's actually created as part of a larger project intended by Professor Hack and Mulcahy. And if you want to study the output of all of the set of courses, they are looking at the course.